here we go, a brand new ups and downs for Ring of Honor. And before you go, where's NXT ups and downs or where's retro ups and downs? Well, this is on his show. I'm a transparent man. And the truth is, you didn't watch them. That's right. You didn't watch them. They didn't do the views. So we're here at What Culture had to make a decision. So if you like ROH and you want these to continue, you have to click the video. Hell, you don't even have to watch it. If you don't want, just put it on and leave the room. Don't do that. However, first up on this brand new Ring of Honor show was Slim J versus Mark Briscoe. And I thought this was so damn smart because if you tuned in with slight reservations, all of a sudden you did see Mark Briscoe. He got a wonderful reaction. Made you feel warm and fuzzy in your tum tum. The setup was also really cool as we definitely embraced the color red and obviously beforehand we had the code of honor. Imagine you have to do this in your real job. Like you go to a meeting like, hi Bob, code of honor. Hi Steve, code of honor. I mean, we basically do that anyway. We just don't say code of honor. As the rest of the trust busters are out though, Ari, Davari, Mark, Sterling, just kept causing distraction after distraction. So even though Mark Briscoe was pretty good at the start here, including when he just booted Slim J in the face, he can't handle people being on the outside of a wrestling ring. So eventually Slim J was back in control and he hit him right in the testicles. Amazingly, this didn't really stop Mark at all, so I guess he has protection down there. But just as he was about to go proper 2023 wrestling, that's right, Mark Sterling once again was casting distraction. Slim was like, well, this is absolutely fantastic. And he was back on top. Ari Davari was then taking cheap shots too. And I'm pretty sure that Slim hit Mark to such a degree that he had a bit of blood on him. But this kind of blood means nothing to me now because I watch AEW. And when you tune into that, as we have discussed, you get human fountains. The whole time I was asking who hired this referee and how is he not seeing any of this nonsense. Like, imagine you never watched wrestling before and you sat down and tuned into it today. You would be like, well, this officiating sucks. Somebody needs to sort it out. It did work, though, because the whole story is that Mark Briscoe is a fighting baby face and he did get back into it. He hit the Spicoli driver. He hit the Froggy Bow before he finished Slim off with the J Driller. And this just made you feel good. Remember, that's why we watch wrestling, to have fun. That magic word we all forget, F-U-N. Instead, we go on the internet and we moan about referees holding ladders and if that is your biggest problem, you have no problems giving it up. Lexi Nair was then backstage interviewing Tony Deppin as we did establish the brand new ROH roster. And I like this because we started to add some characters into the mix. Because Tony wanted to read a pre-prepared statement that essentially said, Samoa Joe, I like you. I think you're a goober and I am going to beat you for one of your titles next week. He also said that he would do this with the STF or chicken wing. I kind of started smelling around during this and I was like, well, it smells like goofy wrestling to me or at least headed in that direction. And I tell you, given that you do have a program like this, you can go truly crazy if you want do it. Which did indeed take us right into our next match, The Kingdom versus The Infantry. A lot of army references on this show. This meant it was Mike Bennett and Matt Taven taking on Sean Dean and Charlie Bravo. And just to kind of sum it up in a nice neat little package, they just had a really good hard hitting tag team match that once again told you, oh hi, thanks for stopping by, we're good at the grappling. Early on too, because it was a tag team match, they just went tag, 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 to once again establish that, oh well, you may have just seen a singles contest, but now we're doing a pairing contest and there's a difference. The Kingdom then remembered they were trying to win, as I swear they smashed out what somebody called a purple thunderbomb, that looked kind of like the blue thunderbomb, so I can only work out that, you know, the blue thunderbomb never pins anyone, so somebody changed the color, but this didn't work either. Maybe we should just call it the thunderbomb, or the bomb of thunder. Taven and Bennett then did whoop ass for a little while until Sean Dean did get the hot tag, and then he used his recovery powers to get Bravo back into it as they went full on double team. They're also gonna go for a double super kick at one point when Matt saved his friend. I was like, well. Isn't that nice? Unfortunately, this completely confused Charlie and the kingdom were able to use this sort of distraction to take his penis and smash it into the top rope. As you can imagine, if you have a penis, that's basically a finisher. It meant they were able to follow this up with a protein pack and they got the win, but we have something with both of these teams. Like I say, when it comes to the fundamentals and everything else, they're just so damn good. So we have to keep an eye on it. And I'm glad they were featured on the first episode. Up. The cool thing was, though, we did get a bunch of surprises. <laughs> Unless you read the internet, then you already knew. Because who was up next? New Japan's Zack Sabre Jr. 
Udalali. He was also defending his NJPW World TV Championship against Blake Christian, and these guys just went absolutely potty. Zack Sabre was all like, oh man, I'm going to do all these octopus holds. Whereas Christian was like, I may be a human, but I can go 752 miles an hour and this rock. The 15 minute time limit was in effect as well. And not only did I think this was Blake's best match I've seen in ages, but this Zack man, he can just adapt to any kind of partner and any kind of a match even though he does get a lot of praise, I still think he's underrated. Zack was also going for all his weird submissions to begin with when he started to focus in on Blake's arm. And honestly, he may as well have just grabbed it and gone like he was trying to rip it off his body. He was putting it in the worst positions ever to the point I was freaking out. And look, there ain't no one around here, which means maybe I put myself in a submission hold, which means I have a massive problem. Even when Christian was able to knock Junior to the outside and go for a 2023 wrestling dive, Zack Sabre Jr. still cut him off. Then once again, he was just working him over. That man could go. He also used the caveat and the ring apron at one point as if it was some kind of torture device. So forget the hardest part of the ring. This was like a flipping Iron Maiden. Sabre then definitely set the internet on fire because he looked right into the camera and said, I'm the best technical wrestler in the world, Brian. And I'm pretty sure he was talking about Brian Danielson. I mean, what other Brians are there? I mean, Brian Blessed, if you know him in the UK, he's basically like a loud dude that walks around and goes, hello. And if you want to do Zack Sabre Jr. versus Brian Blessed, I will pay a lot of money. Finally, Christian did see his opening though, and he did hit the fast forward button. And he hit a 619 kind of on the bottom rope. I don't think I've ever seen that before. He also hit this amazing springboard cross body that he just did effortlessly and then followed it up with a back suplex. Now that only got a two and he was never going to win this, but I tell you, he got something. They were then just reversing flippy move into submission hold and submission hold into flippy move when Zack Sabre Jr. started to pie face Blake Christian, I guess because he wanted to try and wind him up or maybe he's just hungry. It was so good though, because it did work, because all of a sudden Blake Christian hit this Spanish fly. He followed it up with a DVD and he followed it up with a brain buster. And while once again, I didn't think he was gonna be victorious here, did it make me bite just a little bit? Yes. This is when Christian decided, well, the only way I'm going to win is if I hit a 450. That didn't work at all. He went right into Zack Sabre Jr.'s triangle. He had to tap out, he had to submit. Sabre Jr. is still your champion. You should probably go out of your way to watch this. That was good. Up. The Trust Busters and of all people, Takesh do with them backstage. As Mark Sterling was like, listen, Takesh, I know you're fighting Josh Woods later, but how about we just split the purse minus my 5% fee and we just walk away with all the money and nobody has to fight. And then Devari was all like, I'll even give you 10 grand. I was like, what? Why wouldn't you just go out there and fight the guy and save your money? I mean, you could literally lay down on the floor. Just don't make it like Bash of the Beach 2000 because I can't handle it again. Surprise, surprise, the Kester was like, nope. And he ripped off the contract. And thank goodness he did do that because as you'll see, this match rocked. Before that though, we did get a pretty good promo from Christopher Daniels who reminded you how important Ring of Honor was when he came to the ring and of all people, he was taken on Rohit Raju. Now I enjoyed this a lot because we haven't seen Mr. Raju since we used to do impact ups and downs. I liked having him back. He was pushed pretty hard in his time as Impact as well, and I think that is gonna be the same here, because he and Christopher Daniels kinda went back and forth for a little bit. Now, the best thing about Rohit Raju is that he is such an asshole. He doesn't care. He's one of these guys that just wants to be a swarmy little heel. I like him. He also smashed Chris with an elbow when Daniels came back with this big leg, Larry. When Rohit, of course, started to mess around with the referee. Once again, if you're a brand new viewer, you'd be losing your mind. Otherwise, this was pretty straightforward stuff, although Christopher Daniels did do this amazing reversal into a Saito suplex. But when Rohit went for the big old double stomp, Christopher Daniels was like, no, you're not hitting me with that. He went to the top rope, he hit the best moonsault ever, and he got the one, two, three. Now, I am massively intrigued to see what we do do with Daniels in Ring of Honor, because he's such like a part of the furniture, and he can still go. So I am gonna give this an up, and I'm damn intrigued. Red Tyson and Tracy Williams were then backstage and they were kind of sad that they weren't the tag team champions anymore. But they properly fired up here like, man, we've been in Ring of Honor for ages. We've made our careers here. So if anybody wants a fight, we'll fight them. Aussie Open literally must have been just out of frame as well going, oh my gosh, I think someone just did an open challenge because they walked in and yeah, now we're getting this on next week's Ring of Honor. Now, if you've never seen these two teams before, although I'm going to assume you have seen Aussie Open because they were on AEW, this will be pure fire. And they'll probably go out there and try and kill each other. And then, yeah, we did get to Keshta versus Josh Woods, and I will sum it up for you in one sentence. 
it was excellent. The caster is really something special and Josh Woods absolutely has all the tools. We just need to sell his character and his persona more so we have something to properly care about. We also started off with some holds because this is wrestling when Takeshita got him into the corner and did the 10 punches. And I was like, you see, 1983 wrestling will never go out of style. Josh then came back with his gut wrench suplex though and it was so damn good. I was like, man, more people need to do that. And I may even steal it. Which is when Josh decided he was going to focus on Takeshita's midsection. Which means he was probably trying to break his ribs, which makes him a dick. I absolutely love Takeshita though, because his way of getting out of this was going for the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up. But in many ways, I suppose you say he is still a little bit of a rookie, even though he's not. Woods was able to get out of it. He wasn't able to hit a DDT onto the hardest part of the ring when he smashed out his blue thunder bomb. And this really does leave me in a precarious position because that move is ridiculous. I always get people commenting going saying, well, I remember that time Sami Zayn won once with it against AJ Styles. But the point is when it comes to percentages, it never beats anyone. But my word, when Takeshita does it, it's so damn good. Who the flub cares? Woods then came back and just need Takeshita right in the face, which was pretty good. And then they were basically trading suplexes. I was like, man, when do you ever see that? You don't. When Woods went for the Chaos Theory version, though, amazingly, Takeshita once again was able to hit the surprise roll-up, but this didn't work. When he went, I right, well, I know what I can do, and he hit one of those crazy wheelbarrow suplexes thing, which you have to see. It was so damn good. It was like a tree falling, and he got the one, two, three, and that absolutely should be his finishing move. It felt completely different. So you should go out of your way to watch this match as well. It is a wonderful surprise. And actually made me pretty pumped for Ring of Honor. I'll take more of this up. Claudio Castagnoli was then doing his big talking segment because, of course, in the main event, he's defending his world title against AR Fox. It was basically telling us that he will retain his gold and something about AR Fox costing him money. Now, I know this is on me. I know I'm being stupid. I don't understand what he's going on about. And then we basically decided to let everybody know that the embassy are going to be a force. Because Brian Cage Khan and Toa Leona just came out looking like jacked fools. And they absolutely destroyed three guys. I mean, this went for around about, I don't know, 92 seconds. They hit the assisted power bomb. Done. This was Joe Key's LSG and the amazingly named Rex Flawless 2. So let's push that guy because he sounds incredible. And I thought this was quite smart because, again, it is a two hour show. You want to make sure you pace the thing. And right away, you've told everyone who's going to be able to beat the embassy because they got muscles. I like muscles. Weird thing to say. Up. Ari Davari was then back on Ring of Honor. So I really hope he got paid triple. He was facing Grand Metalik though, and yes, he was called Grand Metalik. Because when you go and do a bit of research, he purchased the name. So I suppose WWE was like, oh, we don't care. You can do whatever you want. And this does make a lot of sense. WWE is a global brand, so more people probably associate him with that. It also meant that it was time for our lucha wrestling part of the evening, or flippy floppy wrestling. I don't mean to repeat myself, but once again, it's just a good idea. When you're trying to structure out a show, you got to make sure it's always different. It also allowed Metalik to walk the ropes and hit this drop kick, And of course, all the same idiots were on the outside again. So Slim J didn't like this at all. So he started casting distraction. So somebody really needs to stop down on this because it is out of control. We'll talk about that more in a second. And it also meant Davari grabbed Metalik and just threw him into Rita the ring post like he was some kind of idiot. But very sadly, he then made the stupid decision to climb to the top rope. Because Metalik was able to knock him off there, hit the handspring elbow before he followed it up with a springboard splash. Now, I only got two, but that was a good sequence. Now, we should have known how this was going to end because Mark Sterling was back too. And yeah, he quite literally just got on the apron and distracted the referee when Metalik had the pin after the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. Which essentially allowed Davari to hit what I think they called the in bust we trust move it was just a massive lariat and he got the one two three now look once again this was fun and this was entertaining and i enjoyed seeing these two on my television screen so i am going to give it an up and while i understand the trust busters are going to do this a lot because they're meant to be bad guys they're meant to be morons they're meant to be assholes this did just feel like one too many and like we were repeating finishes i don't think we need to do that on the first show I'm giving it down. Lacey Nair was then back with AR Fox, who was also talking about the main event. And he was like, look, 10 years ago, I tried to get in contact with Ring of Honor and they never called me back. I was like, well, that's just me. However, it goes to show how far he has come because now he is fighting for the world championship. I tell you, we got something with this AR Fox. He a very likable man. Before we did get to that, though, it was Madison Rain and Sky Blue taking on the Renegades. That really made me happy. 
I like the Renegades. It started badly as Blue Dabba Dee Dabby Dee did start to beat up Robin when she tagged in Madison Rain, and because there was two of them there, they beat her up a little bit more. I'm not sure what Madison was thinking though, because Robin just dragged her and said, you're coming with me, and walked over to a corner and tagged in Charlotte. And I was like, well, if it's that easy, everyone should just do it all the time. This still went bad as Sky and Madison essentially just kicked her down until she wasn't able to do anything. But Robin was just sick at this point. So when Madison Rain was kind of in the rope, she ran over. She just booted her right in the skull. I was like, man, I look like it really hurt. Amazingly, Sky Blue then did a double, the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. So she's my brand new favorite wrestler. And the fact that it didn't work is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life because it should have done. When we tagged in Madison Rain, who ran wild. And I think that is a funny turn of phrase in wrestling because I looked up the definition of the word wild and that is behave in an unrestrained or violent manner. Robin didn't want to lose, obviously, so she batted out of a cross rain attempt and she tagged in Charlotte, who hit this awesome Mishinoko driver for a two. And all of a sudden, everybody smacked everybody else and all four people were down. This is good. Blue then came back in with this massive cross body as Madison Rain hit a spear out of nowhere, where I'm pretty sure Blue hit what we called the Skyfall. Now, this isn't sitting somebody down and saying, you've got to watch a James Bond movie. It's this really strange maneuver where you kind of grab somebody's face and just plant them into the floor. However, it did work, they got the one, two, three, and as the commentators had been telling us the whole time, the Renegades are the NWA Tag Team Champions, so now surely we can do a title defense on Ring of Honor, which must mean the NWA Ring of Honor relationship is very good. I, mean, I don't know, who the hell am I? Uh, Wheeler Yuta then came to the ring to cut a promo, and I thought this was absolutely what we should have done, because we had done a lot in the back. <laughs> And he just got so damn mad at Ian Riccoboni. And I get this too, because he called Wheels a junior member of the Blackpool Comeback Club. And you was like, look, I've worked really hard to get to where I had to get to. You wouldn't turn up to a football team and go, ah, you're all children. I mean, he didn't say that bit, that was mine, but he made a good point. If anybody does want to fight for the pure title, though, they can just bring it. And Timothy Thatcher was well up for this, because he accepted the challenge. So once again, next week, we're getting that match. And Ring of Honor did a great job in making you want to come back in seven days. I want to see all of this. Up. Which is also when Willow Nightingale defeated Lady Frost. Hell yeah. Now all I'm going to say is this. If we need to sort of light Willow up on Ring of Honor before she does go back to AEW and starts winning championships there, that is absolutely fine. But be it Ring of Honor or AEW, we just have something Willow Nightingale because the fans love her and not in some kind of ironic way. There's a genuine connection, so we must make sure we take advantage of it. And look, it was still quite a back and forth affair, but ultimately Willow was able to hit the spine buster when she got the gut wrench power bomb for the one, two, three. And the only reason I've zoomed through that in the way that I have is because afterwards she got on a microphone and she was like, Athena, you are the Ring of Honor Women's Champion and I feel like I've won enough and I want to challenge you. Now, this does put us in a little bit of a predicament. because I'm not sure I've seen Athena defend that belt since she won the thing, or at least not on a big stage. So you know what we're going to do? We should turn this into a massive feud. By the end of it, Athena can be a bigger star, and Willow Nightingale can be a bigger star. Once again, I don't even mind if you put some of that on dynamite. I'm very pumped about this. I feel like there's potential here. Up. This also meant it was main event time. Claudio Castagnoli versus AR Fox for the Ring of Honor World Championship did exactly what it had to do. The fans were behind both guys as well before Claudio started smashing out these uppercuts because he is obsessed with Sagat. When AR Fox was like, well, you know, I'm a pretty agile guy, he started to do all these I don't care about gravity moves. I mean, at one point, Castagnoli went to throw him off the top rope, but somehow AR turned that into a head scissors. Although, when he went for a springboard, Claudio just murked him. It really looked like it hurt. He also sold this like Fox had a bad knee too, because Claudio was all over this. And once again, because he is in the Black Ball Combat Club, you don't just start working over a limb. It's like you're trying to kill it. It's so damn gruesome. But after Castagnoli applied a single leg crab and AR got to the ropes, he just dragged him back in the ring and started to stomp on his back. If you had told me that he genuinely hated him, I'd have believed you. Fox was still able to bust out this amazing cutter and he's so damn good at those when he did do this big old 2023 wrestling dive. I don't understand how he makes all this stuff look so effortless. All right, there's just nothing on his face. He just does it. The fans really got into this as well, and there was a great atmosphere, especially when Claudio went from a sharpshooter into a crossface, so he was just abusing all the submissions. But do you know how Fox tried to get out of that with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment? 
And again, very sadly, it didn't work. And then just elbowed each other in the face like that's a normal thing to do when AR Fox did not learn from his mistakes. He went for a springboard again. Honestly, Claudio just ruined him with this uppercut. Once again, it looked absolutely horrible, but it got the one, two, three, and it reminded you. When it comes to finishing moves, it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as it looks impactful, this did up. The best part was the aftermath, though, because as Claudio was celebrating, Eddie Kingston walked out. And of course, this ties into his storyline on social media where he's left AEW. Now, I would still feature him on both shows, but I do have to say, if he is going to be on Ring of Honor more, I'm going to watch Ring of Honor because I love Eddie Kingston. It also worked out for him because he had promised his pal John Moxley that he wouldn't take on Claudio in AEW. But this isn't AEW. There's three different letters, which are ROH. So he wants to challenge him for the world tile. We then continue this whole wink, wink, nudge, nudge that Classic Lonely is going heel because he was just like, whatever. And he walked off as everybody booed. So this is going to be our big main event program going forward. And I tell you this, my friends, I have no problem with it at all. They genuinely felt like stars. Which did bring us to the end of our first ever brand new Ring of Honor, and I actually thought it was a good show. I would certainly try and find ways to include more stories and angles and silly bits, but that's just to my taste. But if you are looking for 120 minutes of just good, solid wrestling action, I tell you, you can't go wrong. Up. Now, please do click one of the videos on the screen to check out another video. We'd appreciate that. Also, like the video, share the video, and subscribe. And we're on social media at What Culture WWE and Simon316. And can you believe it? We also have a website, WhatCulture.com, where we write about wrestling. Otherwise, my name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. We'll be keeping an eye on that big number down there. I will see you soon.